I had been listening to hardcore and punk for years, but I had never gone to a show. And then my first show I went to was Sick of It All at, at uh, City Gardens in Trenton, New Jersey. And we started a band like immediately. When we left that show, I, I was on a high that I think I'm still on right now. And uh, it was just changed my life, you know what I mean? And I said, that's what I want to do. That's exactly what I want to do. We were originally in a band right now, yeah. called Legion of Decency. And we played the very first hardcore show in Philadelphia at the Love Hall. And from there, it just went crazy. I was like, because uh, I was in the graffiti at the time, and anything else that was insane for a kid who was 11 years old or 12 years old or however old I was. And I was like, you mean to tell me I can jump on the stage, run around like a hyperactive little kid, and jump on people's heads, and that's okay? And it was like kind of like this, yo, let's just fuck this whole place up vibe. And I really, really, really responded to the fuck everything aspect of like, we'll jump off the stage, we'll kick your ass, you know, fuck you, you bouncer. The shows that we would go to, you, you know, have one every three months. And that time, there was maybe three at one weekend. So you would have, uh, you know, all these people you'd see every once in a blue moon and you'd start to check them out and recognize them and say hello and talk and then eventually people form into bands. We all decided we were Philadelphia. And that was kind of like the beginning. That was, you know, we all ended up living in this house, 1335, on Robin Street, and uh, that was pretty much like the start for me. Didn't even know a scene existed until I went to a show, and I walked in, looked around, and it was kind of like, wow, you know, I, I'm not the only weirdo like this. There's, there's hundreds more, and it was just like that kind of like sense of community, I guess, more than anything. We went down to see Exodus, and Sick of It All opened up and a local band down there called Forthright from the Lehigh Valley, like a straight edge hardcore band opened up and we're, we never really seen something like that at this point. I went to my first show at IQ Records and that was that. Even if it, you weren't totally fitting in, you just felt like you had a place to go and you were doing something. My cousin brought me to a punk show and I just liked the, the whole vibe of it and just how everyone danced and people just wore what they want, no one gave a shit. Uh, it started with an old caddy playground gig. Uh, a couple of friends of mine drug, dragged me out there and uh, of all bands playing with suicidal tendencies. What threw me to the PA hardcore scene was uh, we went out to see, believe it or not, I think early VOD and this band Crutch. My friends took me to the show and it was just like all these people from school and the shit was right in my fucking face. And it was just like, I just remember seeing Dysphoria and I was like, this is fucking, like this is what I've been looking for. That was me going into CI Records and Tony Pointless was working and he handed me a flyer and he's like, I, I live in this place, style like 13 in West Philly. Uh, here are the shows I'm doing, check it out. Everyone bottle on! I'm up! I will bounce to no one!
think the only problem with PA was uh, it wasn't a label or anything like that to support the scene. Right. So that's why it didn't take off like it did in the other cities. Right. We're kind of like, nobody recognizes us, you know, we're yeah. like off the radar, you know. We had these, these fucking legendary bands to us that never really seemed to maybe break out of the scene. And I, yeah, it's, it's an absolute bum rap because, you know, Pennsylvania has produced and continues to produce some of the best bands in the world. Kid Dynamite and Ink and Dagger and All Else Failed. I don't know, we, we always seem to get the shit. Got passed over a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There was always a lot of good bands out of PA that just kind of went unnoticed. You know, New York City, Boston, they don't think about the in-between. I mean, you would think we're right in the middle of all that. That there'd be some kind of, hey, whoa, hey, what's going on? <laughs> you, know, you start getting around uh, the Harrisburg area, the Philly area, uh, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre. I mean, there, there's so many different cities that Pennsylvania has that gets overlooked because somebody mentioned sick with all that ball, they're like, yeah! It gets overlooked because for a long time it was super dead here. I went to a million great shows in Philly that were to see the best bands that, that were around at the time. Be lucky if there was 150 people at those shows. You had the comps coming out back in the day, New York Hardcore the way it is, New York Hardcore where the wild things are. And granted, much respect to that, that was all great shit. But I mean, that's where a lot of the focus was. But there was a lot of good stuff coming out outside of New York that kind of flew under the radar. Thing is, those guys all had sounds, but that's also meant they were all doing the same fucking shit. You know? So, I mean, informed sources sound nothing like autistic behavior. Autistic behavior sound nothing like wide eye. People might hear, say, the stick men, and if they're not into that style, they might think that's Philly. Or if they hear wide eye or ruin, or they'll think, oh, that's all they do. And Philly did have, you had a lot of like more artsy stuff, industrial stuff, hardcore, old school punk. There's a lot of. That's what made it interesting to be yeah. a part of that scene back then, because you go to a, you know, a Futurama or whatever, and there'd be all these different acts. I will argue that our scene has been consistently, you know, moving and growing more than Boston, more than New York. I mean, we cover a lot more ground, you know, it's hundreds of miles, you know, our scene. There's, I'm just talking about cities, but you know, our, our scene's popping up new bands every day. By the time I got here in 82, there was definitely a scene going on. There was only a few of us. You know, there may have been 50 kids, if, if that. You were either in the autistic behavior camp, which was like the skateboarder, you know, fucking pot smoking, you know, totally having fun. Or you were into the, you know, sadistic exploits trip, which was like, you know, leather jackets and studs. If there was one thing about Philadelphia, there was, there was a sort of respected difference among bands. Philly had a weird sound. Philly sound was everything. It was a mismatch of everything. You know, Pure Hell back in the 70s, uh, the Stickmen, the Reds. The Stickmen were the first original, you know, just kind of like out there. <laughs> Wide Eye is still the best fucking thing ever come out of Philadelphia as far as I'm concerned. Wide Eye was just one of those bands. It was pure aggression. Wide Eye is the one that got me, because it was angry. And, and when I heard that shit, when I heard this fucking chin, I was like, that's what I like. I saw D Control, and that was after the first year terror show. Bands like McRad and like all the skies from Skate Court. FOD put out the first record at 12, 15, 14, whatever they were. They're playing tonight, 30 years. Excuse me, 
musically, Ruin was probably the best band in Philly. Their ideology, their mentality, and you know, they, they could just destroy a room. It was one of those bands that if you never witnessed them live, you could never understand just how amazing they were. I think they were the first hardcore band in Spin Magazine. They were fucking really trippy. And they were into that whole weird Buddhism, Yam Yoho Renge Kyo thing. They were good, but creepy as fuck. They had stage presence, something different. Their music was fucking something different. Um, they just were on some whole other thing. Year, you know, they were years ahead of their time. Yeah, there were certain you know certain DJs that really championed the scene back then. That you know, Eddie Hacksaw being one of them. Ruin killed. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle Polizzi. We played live at um, XBN and KDU. Listening to WKDU, which is a local, they were pretty much the strongest force of radio when it came to punk and hardcore. Howard, Steve I, um, Lenny Bandock, and they they. Brought so many different shows to Philly. Lenny Crunch, you know, he, he put on tons of shows. David Carroll, and David Carroll had Artemis and the Hot Club. Chuck Main, uh, uh, just the shows he put on, the effort the man put out. Chuck's just the finest, you know. He's really yeah. the he's the guy who kind of he was the glue for many many years of of yeah. everything. Nancy Exploit, she really kicked off a lot of shit. First female promoter in the city. The Elk Center, which uh, Nancy. From sadistic exploits, she was their manager. Punk fest is what they called it. Carol Schutzbank was another person who did a lot to. She was she put on more of the shows that were kind of like at a thought of the College of Arts, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Love Hall and you know uh, Eastside Club and all these other different places started to pop up. Love Hall was a little dirty place. Didn't even have bathrooms. They've already pissed in the alley behind it. You know all the clubs on South Street started to develop Grendel's Lair right on right where the Gap is. There was Omnis. Uh, which was at 9th and Walnut. The Kennel Club was short-lived, you had Club Pizzazz, and there was a Y that we used to put shows on there too. Starlight Ballroom was up in Kensington, but they were doing more like big name acts. It was SOA was playing and fucking... But wasn't that when Henry, Henry did the double ticket that night? To my recollection, that was the first time Henry actually took the mic and sang for a little while. And the Philly Punks who would go there, you kind of knew when you went up there, like, you know, it'd be very cool with the locals, you just can't walk into Kensington and and, uh, you know, with an attitude or screw with anybody. It was the DC skinheads versus the Philly punk rock Mohicans versus the Kenzos. The DC people were just like fucking people up and all these Kensington people came in with baseball bats and... It's fucking nuts, man. Once a Kensington guy got caught in a crossfire, uh, you're watching the kids jump this Kensington guy and this Kenyan guy left the show and just was like, you motherfuckers are dead. Then they had the good judgment to do another show to book the dead Kennedys there. I was standing out having a cigarette in front of the place and suddenly this guy threw a bomb like into the crowd waiting out front and like landed like real close to me. We just went boom, exploded on the ground and like uh, people got hurt, you know, one girl had her ankle shredded up. They were putting nails and shit in jars and attaching M80s to them. They, those were the bombs that they were throwing at us. There's dudes coming in swinging baseball bats and people were like screaming and running and stuff. And I do, I vividly remember um, Jello being up on stage. Okay. Also, if I forget when the set is over to say this, um, after we're done playing, everybody's staying here until somebody figures there's a way out without any heads getting bashed.
dysphoria was on another level. Like there was people my age, like Inkling, VCU, you know, fucking Minor Times, even like Leavenworth, the name, CDC, like those type bands, it was great. But the bands in front of us, Dysphoria especially, fucking set the bar, dude. Dysphoria was the one that really did it for me. I mean, I was at every one of their shows, Ty, Kevin, you know, Judd, all those guys are such great dudes, you know, so it's just, for me, they're, they would be the PA band that sticks out for me. So Dysphoria, I think as a band, musician-wise, all five of them, including Judd, I mean, just, they were just good musicians, and it just seemed like they could have, with some of the crap that I've heard, I think they, they should have been on a higher, you know, a higher level. The guys in Shine, um, you know, Inkling was around there, TPFP, all those guys, and, and we seemed to play with them. Yeah, a lot. We really absolutely. did a lot of shows together. And and Mitch, like from 13 PFP, that dude like hooked us up so good, like with Double Down Records and stuff like that. Like he really helped us out. He helped, you know, he helped the scene out a lot for Lansdale. He was, a, you know, I feel he was a major supporter of the Lansdale scene. Chris Spear especially was just constantly booking out shows and would book out dysphoria all the time. The way we did shows was we have a really good couple of really good bands from Boston. We bring them down, you know, like the guys from Death of Shores Honor. It was crazy because we would book a show and all of a sudden out of nowhere, like, we expect 100 kids and 300 kids show up. Well, there was a place called uh, Jumpers that is now in, uh, in Lansdale, which is, it got torn down and turned into an acme. But uh, that place had shows, dysphoria played there a bunch, Chine, PFP, all those bands. And um, that place closed and then um, they started doing shows at the night to Columbus in uh, Lansdale at 8th and Kenilworth, and then uh, 5th and Maple at uh, Celebration St. Marie's. Dysphoria had always sort of been like the staple band from the scene. Um, China, of course, as well. Uh, then there were bands like Problematics, which uh, ex-members of Vince Angel and uh, BPG. Um, and that's really when, when PFP were, were doing most of our shows. Those are the bands that were, were big. And Blue Collar Underworld was, I guess, another band that was playing out a lot. There was a band, Soul Grind, that was doing a lot of shows in and around Lansdale. We were hooked up and friends with them from the beginning. Before Hoop Without Reason, definitely. Um, there's a couple old Lansdale bands like Soul Grind. There was the Fiesta Motor Lodge for a long way back. Uh, that's really where a lot of the... That's where Violent is. Society got their yeah. start. Yeah. Philadelphia it has been really great to us just in general like I mean some of the best shows we ever done but like really like further out in the state was kind of on to us like w like the first shows I remember playing where I'm like yo I think people are starting to get us we're at like Lansdale and Our like Phoenix really Village really and, and stuff yeah. like that. My whole life is playing music and revolves around punk rock and hardcore and it, uh, it all started in a Knights of Columbus Hall in Lansdale. Shine actually broke up right about the time I started going to shows for the first time and so all I would ever hear was like the legend of Shine. I remember the first time we had a show in Lansdale, it was like a big deal to actually play right down the street instead of, you know, driving an hour or two just to play a show. If there's any Pennsylvania hardcore bands that might have impacted my life, I'd probably say, um, oddly enough, Leavenworth was one of like the big things that happened to me because Dave Heck is one of my, my closest friends he took me on tour down to Florida with um, him and uh, some guys in CDC, and it was probably the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. The Meyer Times, uh, you know, you can't say enough about how much that band put into the performance, how much they put into the songwriting, and how underappreciated they were. I think they could have been an international fucking sensation. Nobody knew what the fuck to do to the Minor Times. They had no idea, dude. I remember I'd be out there like fucking dancing it up, like, yeah, you can dance to this part right here. And everybody else is just like, what is this? <laughs> you know? um, but they fucking went hard, man. There's this other scene out there, and it's mm -hmm. a whole different crop of bands and a whole different people. And you move a little further, you know, and you're going to end up with like the Pittsburgh scene. You're going to end up with the Erie scene. Mm -hmm. You're like, you know, like Scranton. Erie yeah. scene. <laughs> PA Hardcore Brotherhood coming at you, respect it and fear it, motherfuckers! <laughs> In 1995, after I graduated high school, I moved up to uh, Erie, PA, and got heavily involved in that scene. It was actually kind of a blessing because we were 
equal distance from Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo. Started having Erie picking up shows, you know, bands like Brothers Keeper, Disciple, Shockwave, Neverfall. The whole 814 area was starting to, you know, really come alive. I think some of the more notable bands that really spawned like early hardcore music in Erie would be like Downpour. Yeah. Um, Last Man Standing. Last Man Standing. Lost. Out of hand. Out of yeah. Hand lost. Yeah, lost. Something to prove. Something to prove. I mean, something to prove is probably like the one that really defined hardcore music in Erie. Brothers Keeper is huge. Brothers, Brothers Keeper kind of put, kind of put Erie on the map. We are Brothers Keeper from Erie, Pennsylvania. They're the first band that everyone thinks of when they think of Erie hardcore. I can't Neverfall, Contradiction, Aggression, Shockwave, Disciple, Brothers Keeper, Red Sky, there's all, all types of bands. Erie was a powerhouse. I'd say some of the, the big heavy hitters in Erie in, in the early days, and this was before I even lived up there, would have been Mike Ski. Sometimes it, it's crazy, but the dude did a lot, you know, for like really like establishing put, put Erie on the map. I worked really hard. I don't at no, all take credit for anything like that because it was like a really like it was re really like a true example of like a community of people. What I can tell you is Mike laid a lot of the groundwork along with other people like Iggy. Our friend Iggy, uh, Ben Frazier, Rob Whipple. Dudes like Larry Weaver and Madsen Zala yeah. were the dudes that were first start setting up the punk rock shows. And if it really wasn't for those dudes and they were the first ones to book out the Continental, you know, it, it, Erie definitely wouldn't have had the, the same scene. EMS uh, is a, the, the owner of uh, Ink Assassin's Tattoos in Erie. He ran Surprise Attack Records, which was just a, an indie record label. Put out a lot of a lot of local bands. Shows in the early, or when I started going early on for me, you know, there'd be a rap group, there'd be a heavy metal group, there'd be a hardcore group. And everybody was just trying to take advantage of the fact that our city was big, but not that big and really tried to work together to make a scene. Everybody got along. That's that's probably the thing that uh, I like the most about the Erie Hardcore scene. You had no retreat, pretty much. Uh, built upon frustration, gut wrench. Our style was a little more brutal than what they did, but the kids always respected us up there. years of my life just traveling around with all of my friends uh, jumping in a van going around jumping on planes going around every e we would play anywhere and everywhere that where that we could we were the first as the hardcore wise but there was other bands there was like long fuse trigger there was blinder out of hand probably our first band around awesome bunch of dudes um, pretty much pains away for everybody else like I moved to Pittsburgh in like early 90s and kind of became a part of the hardcore scene then Back then, it was like my band, Endless, a band called Gut Wrench, a band called Section 315. Gut Wrench has been around forever. There was a time bomb way back in the day. Half Life came from there, and then Submachine and Os Rotten. You know, it, Pittsburgh was definitely a weird hardcore scene. Like, you could go, like, Earth Crisis would play down there, and there'd be three, four hundred kids. Pittsburgh kids were a little different. They sort of followed their own favorite bands, and then when those bands either you know got big or or stopped playing, then they sort of stopped going to shows. Batter Citizens turned into Time Bomb, and then uh, when once those guys broke up, and then hardcore was getting a little bit more uh, political oriented. There was bands like uh, Passover, Chapter. Um, Slowpoke. Slowpoke. Oh, Slowpoke yeah, you can. Awesome. Yeah, Slowpoke was amazing. Club Lager, uh, Millville Industrial Theater was huge. Saw some great shows there. It was literally an industrial park <clears throat> that they just, the roof leaked in the winter. They'd literally have torpedo heaters and tarps, like plastic tarps up to try to keep it somewhat warm. Spot in Lawrenceville called Cool Peppers Hot House, uh, Club Graffiti. Graffiti was one of the best clubs. For shows, used to see Strife and Crown of Thorns and some of the, a lot of the New York bands out there. In February of 89 was the first show at the Continental Ballroom. That was a great place. It was just a, 
kind of kind of the middle of a neighborhood and was the old uh, old ballroom that kind of had a setup for like a jazz band with a couple levels for the stage and everything. It had like a tin foil ceiling with mirrors all behind it and would just sweat and drip down on everybody as the bands would play throughout the night. You'd have different spots in Oakland like the attic, um, like different CD warehouses there for a while in Latrobe. There's a place called the Rally Alley. There was an old car wash. It, it just, I remember it was like a fucking oven in there. Like every show was like a thousand degrees. You'd have kids passing out from dancing. Boys and Girls Club and every time I went to a show it, the, the, the attendance doubled. After Continental, everything kind of moved to a place called IQ Records, which was right on State Street, kind of downtown Erie. And, and once again, the shows were huge. Uh, Brothers Keeper and Disciple and Shockwave were pulling in a lot of kids, and the, the vibe was awesome. In Erie, I always end up at the same punk house where it's like some fucking crack den. I don't know how we always end up there. And we were on tour. Last time I was in Erie, I was on tour with Fang, and we ended up there. So, you know, that was a fucking special something going on. I don't even, a lot of vomit going on in that place. Uh, there was uh, Mr. Roboto was in place. Roboto was in uh, a living room in a really crappy neighborhood in Pittsburgh. Fort Hall, that was a big one. That was big. Um, they did their first hardcore show in 1998, if I remember right. It was uh, Extinction. Disembodied, Brothers Keeper, and another victim. And that show, it was over 600 people there. At the end of the subculture, the walls were just obliterated. Everything was obliterated. I had to put up plywood the whole way around the place. And at the, the end, when I was done with the place, it, to fix it back up so the guy didn't sue me, it literally <laughs> took me, no joke, 40 hours, a full 40 hour week by myself to get it back in condition. Things would get too crazy and uh, they'd shut it down and then uh, you'd have to find another place to, to play and that became more and more difficult, which may have also led to the, uh, the failure of the scene to kind of keep going. Built upon frustration, that uh, CEO Resurrection is like one of the craziest records ever. It was so good and I feel like that's a band that no one knows about outside of like, you know, Pittsburgh area. Consistently like stupidly heavy and I think for us in Pittsburgh we were always kind of sort of upset that they never got bigger because we wanted people to appreciate what they had to offer and uh, I know everybody secretly wishes for a build upon frustration reunion. The mid to late 90s when Brothers Keeper were, was really like on fire there'd be four or five hundred kids every, oh, yeah. show. every show. Easy you know. That's I mean for a town that's less than a hundred thousand people that's that's a pretty big accomplishment. Shockwave, uh, I guess I was at their last show, if that would be considered their last show. Just, I always appreciated a band that would just like get ridiculous for the sake of just getting ridiculous, like they really didn't give a shit. Uh, every show was an event, um, especially in Erie, a hometown show. Uh, for some reason everybody picked, Shockwave picked that area. Kids would dress up as robots and Santa Claus and all kinds of crazy barbarian making their own weapons and just battling when they played and traveling around people would always ask us questions about them tell us that they heard rumors that they just sat in their front yard lifted weights and, and listened to gangster rap we were like yeah maybe we, we, we don't really know we don't know a whole lot about them generally the communication was very sparse they would get a hold of us if they needed shows set up or whatever and the best thing about shockwave is you know that was like the biggest joke that freaking succeeded ever <laughs> in the whole world you know they were all from like different bands and traded their instruments up and sang about Transformers. <laughs> Story. 
people don't understand is that if you were from central Pennsylvania in the 90s, you drove for shows because there was no shows in central Pennsylvania. So we drove our asses off just to see every single band every weekend that we could go and see because there was nothing else to do. You could either go skateboarding, drink, party, or go see a hardcore show. They Mostly we uh, had to find fireballs, um, YMCA's, any place that would let us do a show. Uh, we did have Little Joe's, which is a bar in Harrisburg, and occasionally they'd let us do maybe a Sunday afternoon show, something like that. I, I think we had the Necros and uh, Suicidal Tendencies played there once on their very first tour with Corrosion and Conformity. Katasakwa is really like, they're, they're the grandfathers of punk rock around here. If, if, if you talk about punk rock around here, you, can, you cannot bring up Catasauqua. Catasauqua and Allentown, actually, I mean, a lot of bands played there back in the day. Like Misfits played, I think, Catasauqua Playground. Clearfield was a real good spot. Um, you, you'd play a show, like, in, like, a fucking, it's like a storage shed out in the middle of, like, some park, and there'd be over 100 kids piling. Uh, you know, you had uh, Not Without Resistance from Clearfield. Uh, they did real well for a while. Clearfield, Pennsylvania, Altoona, Pennsylvania, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, because it all just from that way came this way and from the east came that way, met in the middle, and it was like boom. PA to me has always kind of been too, though, like, like places like Altoona and, and Lewistown, where, and uh, I mean, we've been to some pretty, pretty weird towns out in the middle of nowhere where there's kids that are super stoked though. The cool thing about where we grew up in Jim Thorpe, it was between everything. Like, Wilkesboro Scranton is same distance as going to Allentown or almost the same distance as going to Reading. So we were really centralized as far as all that goes. They were doing shows at the um, Arts House basement, which was kind of like uh, where all the art students lived. There was a little record store called Purjays, and then there was a used clothing store called Classic Rags. Didn't we play once in the basement of Crap Rock? We did, in fact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was a good time. Yeah, I remember we were all excited to play Crap Rock. We're like, oh, this is going to be so cool. And we get there, they're like, no, you guys go downstairs. That's where you're playing. <laughs> oh. All of the J's, Wally's, and Allentown ish, uh, the four G's. It was all Allentown. Um, and then the airport music hall. Uh, and the Unisound out in Reading. Unisound was this straight up underground club that, you know, it was, for some reason it had this, this bad hype about it, this bad vibe. 89, 90, 91, 92. It was a spot where, at the time, New York City was not able to have too many hardcore shows because of the violence out there. So, a lot of these bands were rotating through good old Reading, Pennsylvania and the, the shows that we were getting over there and the people that were traveling from out of town, they were, they were tremendous shows. They were just absolute fucking mayhem. We started driving three hours come up to this place in, you know, called Yuja Sound and it was insane. Like it was, uh, you know, it was, it, there was no charge, but it was, uh, you had, it was like mandatory donation. Uh, and there was, you know, no drugs, no alcohol, no racism. You know, it was like a really solid place. There was a, there was a skate ramp in the back. They had two stages, and every show that I went to there had minimum 600 people. Uh, it was just booming here. Um, this was like regular stop for all the bands, like you know, Sick of It All, Biohazard, Sheer Terror, Shelter, 108. It was a really sketchy place. The owner didn't have any insurance on the place. It was like broken down, like looked like something out of like Judgment Night. Uh, and the floor, you could feel the floor move. <laughs> they were, you know, it was so uh, disheveled. Allentown we started going to, which was good and bad. I mean, back then it was really bad as far as like violence and uh, skinheads and like, it was really, really bad. I mean, 
and uh, you know, unfortunately, they they got the best of it, and everything closed down, and they they could only do they couldn't do shows there anymore. They can only do like small DIY shows, you know. We couldn't do shows at the fire hall anymore. The Wire, which was a coffee shop in New Cumberland, had closed down, and uh, we sort of were like, hey, you know, we need we need a space. It's it's time. Let's let's try and find something. So we found a space in Lemoyne, uh, in a strip mall. We were there for. Yeah, let's see, about three years till they decided they did not want us there anymore and basically got evicted. We paid the bills. They just didn't want a punk rock venue in a strip mall. Old Championship and that strip mall was fantastic because for me growing up, I never found anything like that. So we uh, moved half a mile away to another location down by the river, which was known as Championship. That's probably how most people knew it. Uh, it was an old train yard from a steam engine from the turn of the century that was a storage facility that we converted into a venue good space could hold about 400 people cap and then had a record store in the front that's really where I feel like we sort of put a mark on the scene of Harrisburg we were able to do a lot of stuff you know Wisdom and Chains will tell you played a lot there uh, did the Youngblood 10-year showcase there uh, which was Striking Distance Reunion which is a huge show uh, we were able to get like convergence ceremony and definitely doing bigger hardcore shows packing that place out it seemed like it kind of went in spurts though you know, there'd be nothing happening in Harrisburg, there'd be something in Lancaster. Nothing in Lancaster, maybe Reading. It was just a, a highway of bands coming through Pennsylvania all the time. I mean, I started out seeing the Exploited at Airport Music Hall, and then uh, MDC at Oliver J's, Agnostic Front at Oliver J's, Youth of Today at Oliver J's, you know, and then there was Wally's, it was Murphy's Law, Gorilla Biscuits, Uniform Choice, Gigi Allen. Um, you know, and it was just amazing. And it's like, this is what I want to do. I was in a band starting in 1983 in State College called Positive Hate, which, uh, looking back, you would have classified as pretty much of a generic hardcore band. You know, hardcore band strictly influenced by other hardcore bands. Joy Friedman is a person who probably deserves kudos for uh, putting stuff together back then in Lancaster. Uh, York occasionally would have some stuff. There was a band called Second Crisis from York, probably one of the first hardcore bands from that area. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of shows down there from time to time. 999 used to play at the Caddy Shack. They used to bring all kinds of touring acts like the Park Duke. So. There was uh, Combat Control, The New Left, and Friction, and the late teens. AWOL would have been the first. Uh, first really hardcore punk rock band around here and then they turned into Syndicate. Bands like Frontside, bands like Always Uprising, uh, bands like No Compromise. There was a band called Stand Your Ground. I would go to a lot of shows in York. There's a band called Bond Society from Philly who used to come down a lot. A band called the MFC from York. Fourth Right, I mean, they, they were a straight edge like uh, hardcore band in the vein of like, they're kind of like uh, grill biscuits, stuff like that. You know, you live in a place like Philly or, or Pittsburgh, you've got three, four shows a week to choose from. So you might not, uh, you might miss out on a lot that way. But around here, I'm growing up, I know we appreciated each and every show there was. We'd go early, try and see every band start to finish. This is it, this is where it all started. My first hardcore show, LS Skaterama, 
and uh, one of the first bands that he brought in from out of town was uh, Bouncing Souls. So it was uh, Bouncing Souls, Wilson's Wackos, and Positive Energy. Like, there'd be a ton of us fucking, like, back in the day, I had this, uh, this a fucking huge ass Impala. We had, like, you know, like three dudes in the front, like five in the back seat, two, two cats be in the trunk if they really wanted to go. And we go up to Spankies or, like, CCs and shit like that. You big cities are extremely spoiled. You have three shows a week, sometimes more. I like when there's three a month because it fucking... It keeps you hungry. Like, all right, three or four shows a week, you're gonna get smaller turnouts where, cause it's like, I'll just go to the next show. When you lived in Scranton and Wilkes-Barre or Erie or Lansdale, you went to every show, no matter who was playing. Everybody from around here, we're like a geographic anomaly. We're two hours from everywhere. We're kind of a good microcosm of that in that we got so every band that ever toured, any hardcore band has always played here. First show at the VFW in Newfoundland, and I remember drawing up the flyer for it while I was in art class in high school and like running to try to get copies before we got in trouble. My fondest memory of the Pancake House was like the toilet backing up, <laughs> and that carpet was like soaking wet and had mushrooms, mushrooms. growing out of it. AFA Art Gallery had a handful of shows in Scranton. Proof Rocks. Proof Rocks in Scranton had shows. The zoo. The zoo. We were just talking about that on the way down. God, we loved that place. Gallagher's. Uh, the old staircase. It's the old staircase. Uh, uh, the roller rink down in Kingston. All the little one-offs. We had West Side Park. We had shows just randomly at you know Redonos. First Blood for Blood show in Pennsylvania was at West Side Park in Danny Coke. Uh, our friend Dad Mills was booking shows at the time, and I think they came down here and played for like a hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, right now, I mean, we're starting the new Redwood. Um, it used to be. Um, Backstage. Backstage. That was our first show. The brother of one of my guitar players in RSB. Um, guy had a pool hall under, uh, it was basically the basement of James. We had a big shopping center. <clears throat> they had a pool hall down there. It wasn't too large, but he said he wanted to do concerts. We played Earth Crisis first show out of New York State, I think was at the factory. And I remember it had that fence in front of the stage. I remember the first time VOD played here, they were supposed to play with Life of Agony at CeCe's, Life of Agony canceled, and VOD headlined the show, and you may have even been at that show, and kids never heard of VOD before, but they just went fucking nuts. The best thing I remember about Pennsylvania is CeCe's. It was probably our first out-of-state show ever. It was the best. Explosive shows, unlimited fucking beer. Dan Ingolson brought the first hardcore show to CeCe's. Um, it's, and CC's is like the CBGB's of Pennsylvania. So many of us grew up at CC's, you know? And Vince was like a weird stepdad, I guess you could call him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like in, in, in some sort of way. Cause he, I mean, he really took care of us. He looked out for us. Like, I, I don't know why he cared about us, but he did. I just paid off the, the sewer bill from CC's only about two years ago. Oh, why? The bill was like $19,500. I never paid any, I never made a payment. Finally, they, they came after me. Vince, he knew everyone's first name and their band name. So he called you like Eddie Denial. Or <laughs> yeah. Tony Denial, you know? Yeah. So we ended up taking it on. I remember like calling up the owner and he would like never remember us. Like, he'd be like, God forbid, are you, are you hardcore? You hardcore? You know, he would, he would never remember us. What it was, the thing that was cool about it is he would like, you could cold call him and he would book you. I think I mostly spent my time at CC's because yeah, I was underage, so I had to go where I was allowed. By far, CC's is my favorite era of hardcore, period. CC's was real important. I mean, it was uh, constant shows. Big Wig was on tour with a band, uh, Blunt, from California, and another snowy story. And we showed up at CC's, nobody there. The show was canceled, and Vince is like, I don't want you guys driving home, sleep overnight. So we slept overnight at CC's. And me, Tom Petta from Big Wig, and Shannon Sharp of Wisdom and Chains all sat on a floor, excuse me, slept on a floor under a blanket, the three of us. Kind of like that, I don't care. <laughs> fucking freezing, because Vince didn't want to turn on the goddamn heat. CC's was like a meeting ground. Like you would go there, and honestly, I know I said it in our my stream for a reason. It, you would go there, and when you pulled up, everybody would chant your name. Like if there was 300 people there, you probably knew 250 of them. The owner of Vince was a character, his so old dad would sit by the door, ornery old dude. Old man CeCe's is what we would call him. He would call everybody a chiseler. And uh, if he thought you were trying to 
sneak in. You were a chiseler, but it came to the point where you would hand him money and he would still call you a chiseler. Like everybody was a chiseler to this guy. My father's the doorman collecting the money and I, I can hear this ruckus at the door, you know, and I thought I better go out and see what's going on. So I go to the door, I said, Dad, what's going on? He goes, Well these guys are trying to get in. I said, Dad, that's the band. I said, You gotta let them in, they're the band, they're the band band. Oh, they're trying to sneak in. I said, no, 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 I said, they're cool. And I remember Vinny saying, Vinny saying to me, because my name is Vince also, he called me Vince Vinny. Where's your dad from? Is he from Brooklyn? I go, no. He said, he's from Old Forge. He goes, oh, we thought he was from Brooklyn, the way he was acting. He was trying to throw us out. CeCe's was phenomenal. I saw some of the best shows ever there. Uh, man, I, <laughs> thousands of shows. 25 to Life, Pit Boss, Side Over was one of the big bands up there. Option, there was this band Final Stand. They were really cool. Uh, bands like No Retreat, Strength for a Reason, started practicing there back in the day. The two Memorial Day festivals, actually there were three of them. I got to do those. That was an opportunity to do, uh, you know, something like this. Start at start at noon, just go all the way into the night, and have have a show where basically you have like about you know seven or eight headliners. You know, at the time we were we were rolling pretty good. You know, we had a lot of bands, and like you say, we were like the hardcore club of Northeast of Pennsylvania. They were saying at the time, so we really, I guess we did make an impact. You don't realize it until later on, more and more. You know, and I'm glad to see it's that's still going on. Spanky's a uh, short-lived spot. Had some good shows. I tried to really get in there and uh, and make it work, but the owner was like, uh, he was a little nutty. He was kind of like this mob type dude. Dragged our balls through glass at Spanky's. You know, that's where we learned. Yeah. We learned the ropes. Um, you know, we met tons of people there. There was an instance where, um, while Life of Agony was playing, one of the uh, one of the uh, breakers uh, or one of the uh, fuses went. So I had to. It, it would have literally taken me 45 seconds to run around the building and go through the other, uh, the other, the back way. But their bouncer that they brought with them decided to just take the door off the hinges with his muscle. It's still giving them a problem. Go fuck it. We'll just we'll take place down first. This one's called Betsy. Come on, Joe. Fuck him. Oh, don't even talk, fuck. A friend of ours uh, knocked down the door to the control room to flip the switch back on. And obviously that's when the damage starts. Our singer said at one point, I want, you know, just to get the crowd excited, I want to see you guys tear this roof down. Last one of the fucking night, I want to see the ceiling fucking come down. Punching the ceiling and getting on people's shoulders and punching the ceiling. And that was it, man. He said, bring this fucking place down, and everything came down, man. <laughs> I never saw anything like it in my life. Look up. <laughs> I never fixed it. This is the damage? We still get people coming up to us after shows or at the merch booth and things like that with pieces of the ceiling from the pancake house to sign. And it's just one of those shows that you can never forget. Oh man, I was like, this is, you know, like, that's hardcore. Yeah, I was like, that is hardcore, <laughs> and I'm not insured for it. Did you get that fucking ceiling torn down? Sure. All right. Wisdom in Chains for me is the epitome of what Pennsylvania hardcore is all about because they're just a fucking amazing band. They're the first PA band that I really kind of became like obsessed with because it kind of takes a lot of my old punk rock roots and melds it with hardcore. With Man Chains, the, the, the scene anywhere in the world, Pennsylvania's always been brothers. They're great people. It's the best place to be. And Feeble was cool because back then everybody was trying to be heavier than each other, tougher than each other. And Feeble came out being, uh, you know, more melodic punk rock element, not scared to show that side. The first real hardcore show I was at, Strength for Reason was the first band that played. And, you know, that was just, it blew me away just seeing people like actually, you know, climbing up and fucking grabbing the microphone and interacting with the band. <laughs> There was no 
cooler band. I'm not just trying to say it. There's no cooler band to see than Strife for a reason. Like every show that they played, they was fucking insane. And like being that young and seeing that was like really changed everything. <laughs> Throughout the years of Crutch, we would pick up different guys, different bands, and then that's kind of how we made some relationships with, with different areas, different bands. Dogs on chains? No, a year before. It might have been a year. Then we changed it. We changed the band members and we took another name on Mesh. So what? It was one of the first bands up there that I was exposed to. I mean, we all know Option was a great band. They were. Man. Sido was a great band. Solus was a great band, and Solus was different than you know what mm -hmm. I mean. And I was like at Gita's band, uh, Bedford, too. Bedford? They were great little, um, a lot of fun. Burial Ground, come on. We all loved Burial Ground. Come on! Option really did a lot for our scene. Option yeah. really, you know, Steve and the guys in Option did, and, and Jamie and Burial Ground, those yeah. two bands for me were really, they were really like the hardcore. They were our area. Other bands like, other Pennsylvania bands, Weston was another big band that I really yeah. think had a huge impact on our area um, and, and shaping our scene and shaping. Well, there was like, a lot of crossover. What kind like of music, stuff right. What kind of music. Hardcore stuff. Yeah, because back in the day, like you didn't go to a show that was, that was, you know, you didn't go to a metal show or a hardcore show. You went to a band where you would see Burial Ground play with, like, copper. You know what I mean? Or, you know, in a friggin' disc. A fabulous disaster. Right. Cabbage Collective are one of the most important like things to know about Philadelphia because without the Cabbage Collective they would have never had the church and without the church we wouldn't be where we are now. You know the history that's come out of that room like that's an East Coast Gilman Street. You know like every big band has you know played there or been there at some point. When we moved down there and oh man I remember getting rides down to university arts shows and going to the truck back in the day getting rides down there and I've always loved that scene. Philadelphia back then, you know, was a really tough scene. They people loved you or they freaking hated you, you know, and and they let you know it. At the time, the fact that it was scary, that there was violence, that things were going down, that was just fun for me. That was like part of why it was exciting. We all ended up moving to this house, uh, what was it 314 North 19th Street, and out of that house, you know, we had suburban fanzine. We had uh, Ink and Dagger, we had Crud as a Coal, we had Contention Records, um, iBook shows, Don Book shows. So this one house kind of spawned a lot of the stuff that went on in the city. There's a lot of great musicians, a lot of great bands, but music fandom in Philadelphia and surrounding areas is pretty intense. And um, you don't have that in a lot of cities. You, you, you figure that out really fast if you go on tour. Philadelphia was the first city that showed us real love. I mean, even before our hometown. You know, the Revival had a, a couple shows here and there every once in a while. Uh, then uh, then came, you know, the Kyber, you know, was there for a long time. J.C. Dobbs was there for a long time. Have, that was where they had the Sunday matinees, you know. I mean, upstairs at Nick's, 
which is gone. You put six or eight kids in a house that has a big basement that you can stand up in, and they're gonna have bands play there. Stalag 13, Tony Pointless, ran that for many years. Me and, um, you know, Bull from Cabs Collective and Andrew Martini, um, Kill the Man of Questions and Limpress, like, you know, Andrew lived around the corner, and me and him, we really were the ones that started pushing for Stalag to be more of a venue rather than a house. You know, the first era of Stalag, where everybody's a little bit more punk, the crustier element come. You see a couple of skinheads would show up to some punk shows. There would be fights. People would pull hammers out. And it was cool at that time to not fight with the squatters, but to fight against the Nazis. And then you started having a bunch of gentrification with some of the white punk kids who only got it there because it was cheap and they could do shows. That time in West Philly, particularly when there were these warehouse shows, you know, it was really unbeatable. There was something exciting happening there. Stalag was great. It, it started out as just a squat punk house that did shows, and it was a lot of stuff like you'd like Converge would play there all the time, Drop Dead would play there all the time, uh, Burn the Priest before they were Lemon God would play there all the time. They even talk about it still to this day when you see them go play. They're like, ah, oh, who's here when we played at Stalag? It was weird because at home we could play to like 25 people, and then we go to Stalag, and it'd be like three, four hundred people crammed in there. Just crazy. When a mic went on or something weird happened, I ended up like trying to fix it and gradually ended up, I was there so often that they sort of came to me to do the sound. And I'm like, there's not really much to do there other than monitor the board a little bit. So. There was a gentleman named Mikey Brosnan uh, who actually, to my knowledge, started Stalag 13 or you know, definitely was one of the first tenants to live there. If it wasn't for him, a lot of Philadelphia hardcore I don't think would be here. Stalag 13, I uh, was one of the first places we played. Uh, Kill Time. Every band in the 90s played there. Uh, I got to see a lot of shows there. Eventually shut down, then everything moved over to Kill Time. A lot of great shows there. I still, to this day, don't know how they got that giant head out of the building. <laughs> we call it Palenka Park, Padunka Village. So Bob Meadows would book us up there, you know, and he did a lot for us as well. God forbid, uh, Shai played there, Converge played there, Hope Conspiracy, uh, Saves a Day, which that's fire. Two A Team was basically this. Have you ever seen the movie The Gate where like the thing opens in the backyard and it just sucks you in and you can't get out of it and you kind of have to fight the demons that are there? It was kind of like that. Harry Cats! Harry Holy cats. fuck! Harry Cats! That was the coolest place ever because you know what? You could kick the ceiling top Yo, down, you, you remember, could punch the wall. Remember the one dude that told him about Baltimore? He was like boss. Skinny Steve! Yeah, he lost the top of his finger. Banging Babies, that's probably... That's probably my favorite Pennsylvania band of all time. Two of the first records I bought were uh, Ink and Dagger, uh, Drive the Seven Inch, Seven Inch Wooden Stake to My Philadelphia Heart. So that like put Philly on the map for me. And then I Hate You. Dare to Defy. That's another band that played a lot of good shows. This day forward, it was uh, Jared Rome, um, even uh, Life Sick Life. We weren't like, all right, forget all that stuff, let's be a hardcore band. We were like, well, let's just be this band that's just everything. Like, it's just whatever, you know? Like, then you listen and, to Seven Inch, and it's really not, I don't even know where we got yeah. heavy, because it, it, that Seven Inch isn't heavy. Yeah, it's, Oh, yeah, shit. You want to talk any more shit? <laughs> All else failed, if you're going to go with chaotic hardcore, they're the most angry, pissed off band that has ever fucking existed, in my opinion. They live it and bleed it, you know, like, and there, there isn't many bands out there that will ever be even close to that level. For them not to be huge was beyond my, my realm of comprehension. To see them live, to see the kids singing along, to ev not, not just every word, but the samples, to know where it all came in, and you, you, when that band played, the energy in the room changed totally.
as soon as they came around, it was like, what the fuck is that? You know, they they used to have two singers that would beat each other up on stage. So, you know, I'm all over that. Every time I saw them, it, it was visceral. It was powerful. Absolutely fucking terrifying. They yeah. beat themselves into oblivion. Oh, yeah. And even, they're one of those bands that every time... It was scary back when I first started seeing them when I didn't know them. And I was like, mm. fuck, these dudes are nuts. There's yeah. two singers and they're punching each other in the face while they play. What's going on here? I remember seeing them, a free show at Stalag. And it was Kill the Man of Questions, and it was them, and they played as the, as the six piece, as even the six piece. And, and they went into the first song, and, I, and I've never fucking seen anything like that. Still to this day, I've never seen that. It, it fucking, that changed my life. That, that made me the front man. Luke, Luke Muir made me the singer I am today. Like, just that intensity and passion. I think we're at a point in our lives where it's, uh, easier to be content with what you have as opposed to when you're like full-time active band you're always pushing and trying to get to a next level and getting pissed off at where you're at and being like why are we on this stupid show or why are we on this fucking town or whatever like now it's like well this is tonight like this is it this is the night i'm going to be thinking about for the next six months turmoil 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 um and they're a great fucking band you know and they're one of those bands like to me they're a band's band like they don't I don't think they got the recognition that they ever deserved. No. Um, they're no. phenomenal. Everybody was like, oh, you can't, you can't fuck with Turmoil. Like, that's good shit right there. Um, yeah, that was one of our favorite bands. Definitely an influence for us, too, back in the day. John Gould, hands down to me, is one of the best singers in hardcore ever. One of the turning points for me was seeing Turmoil. I mean, you know, those guys are, like, uh, so incredibly heavy. You know, I'd never heard anything like that before uh, I saw those guys for the first time. And they, uh, they just blew me the fuck out of the water. Turmoil, you know, was a band that... that, that you know, probably at that time, probably my favorite band that was purely a hardcore band. You know, you couldn't. You know, I'm, I'm definitely a metal guy. You know, um, and they, that you know that you know the process of was probably my favorite hardcore album of all time. Yeah, Philly is. There's no other place to this date like where you will get all that type of music, and everybody's appreciative of it. I mean, I live out west now, and there's no scene whatsoever. Our band never was really in the hardcore scene. We were like hardcore kids that played in like weird metal. Starkweather was probably the, the biggest one out of Philly that was underrated. I don't know how they're not like the band right now. How are they not like Lamb of God right now? You know, it's beyond me. They were fucking, they started. Remy's the first person I ever saw like right in the, you know, in the middle of like a, you know, almost like a death metal sounding song, just break down and start singing. And it, you know, and the way he did it, it's better than anyone is ever going to do it. Starkweather would be a perfect example. Way, way fucking under. Starkweather was always a band that I was always, I always felt they were, I don't know, like just totally not, like nobody cared about them that, that beyond this area. And I'm like, man, these guys are fucking awesome. Like, especially for the time and everything, I always thought they were like a lot before their time, you know? When you say underrated, you're not speaking about Starkweather because you can't rate something that never wanted to be rated. Without Starkweather, you don't have Converge, you don't have Dillinger, you don't have... You don't have most of the bands that are have these infamous names now. I had Starkweather actually come out maybe six or eight or ten years, like when the new metal and the hardcore kind of kicked in. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably would have been one of the biggest bands. They have like this uh, diehard fan base, but just like a lot of bands, they're, it seems like they're very regional. Mm -hmm. All else fail, same thing. It's like you can't take, you take them out of Philly, nobody. Our output's infrequent, you know. <laughs> we do it on our time. We do it with our money first, and then if somebody wants to buy it from us, fine. Fireworks, 
fucking, I think lobsters and mice or some shit like that. You know what I mean? Fucking barbed wire throwing chairs in the middle of the room. There's fucking fireworks and fucking, I was just like, I, I was absolutely out of my mind. I just wanted to find a way out of the joint, honestly, you know what I mean? But hey, listen, whatever floats your boat. part of the reason you liked it. You know, you weren't friends with everybody when you walked in the door. The um, original satanic rave, I showed up too late. Uh, I saw the cops beating on my friends. I saw fireworks going off and being shot at cops. The kids in the crowd take it to such a level, man. There's, there's just weapons and to watch it, it's awesome to watch. But if I were standing in the middle of that, I. I'm a big, ugly motherfucker, but I'm t I don't want to get hit with a bat. Everybody got all of their damage. It's like, a, here we go again. Man, it's going to get broken tonight. Somebody's going right. to get hurt, and it's going to be someone we know, and they're just it's going to be their own fault, and somebody just threw a disco ball at Steve Bush, and whatever. Oh, yeah. Blood, <laughs> blood, fireworks, <laughs> naked dudes. I was hit in the back of the head with a recliner. Not a chair, a <laughs> recliner. Do Bad Luck 13 shows? You know, a lot of times the Band Love 13 shows were never the band. It was always someone in the club being like, that's it, I'm going to fucking stop you, motherfucker. And it's like, how can you stop 150 people? What what by what means? going to throw a net on everybody? Like, what are you going to do? Band Love 13, fucking Yankee accent. Them guys, I remember when they had to try to go on tours, so they couldn't, like, you know, set fires in the club or, you know, uh, you know firebomb the fucking parking lot or whatever. All those guys are awesome dudes, <laughs> you know, they're just fucking nuts. All this, you know, Jay's crazy, but he's like the nicest dude. The way we got on Hellfest is uh, I used to play cards with that, one of the dudes who ran it, and he lost a bet, so bad luck headlined the, uh, the side stage. But the, the lineup of that, of that, the way that went down, I knew something, was, you, you knew it was on. It was fucking, you know, it was, uh, it was 25 to life marauder bad luck on the hot topic stage, you know, at the end, you know. It was bound to it was bound to get nuts, you know. As far as I'm concerned, being in a hardcore punk band is all about letting out aggression. And I was always fine with it. I did not want to be in a band where people are standing around with their thumbs up their asses, you know, just got their backpacks on and just fucking standing there like wallflower. I want people going freaking nuts. And you know what? A fight's gonna happen once in a while. So be it. Minor Threat was playing a show over in Camden and it was in a rough neighborhood. Me and Zeke and a bunch of the guys that skated in Philly, we actually took the subway over there. The guy was like, don't do that because you guys are going to get chased. And we literally got chased by a dude, like 12 dudes throwing like bricks. I see Ian kind of like flip over the front of the hood and then go, to the f go down on the ground but catch himself and then look at me and go, did you see that? We were in the van. And I remember the whole thing like shifting. It was like an earthquake, you know? And he's like, what the fuck, you know? And it turned out that we had gotten rear-ended. A car, a person in the car literally swerved and tried to either hit the van or hit him. And he was on, I guess, in or on it or jumped on the van and fell off and smacked the back of his head. He seemed to be okay. And uh, he, you know, he went to play the show. He actually played the show. Yeah, that's how hardcore it was. You get hit by a car, and the next thing you're up on stage still playing the show. The Exploiter were traveling the country in a, like a camper. And that was just like people just fucking beating the shit out of this thing. And you know, you're, the whole time, you're, and the guy here is, is interviewing me about pegging baby stuff, and then he's peeking down, he's peeking down here going, what do you think of that? And I went, I went you know, but that fucking blows, man. <laughs> you know, you put bands on like Sacred Reich and Sepultura with Biohazard and Sick of It All and Napalm Death, you know. The audiences back then weren't exactly uh, best buddies, you know. So you had a clash of uh, the heavy metal world coming coming into the, the punk rock world. Allentown, with all the Nazis, you little kids have no idea what it was like. Airport. We used to start going to, with all the Nazi skinheads because you were lucky, you had a shaved head. This guy always had hair. 
And they and it was but weird. that didn't make me safe. All I know is all the windows start getting broken into TLA. Ishka bibbles and they're all shutting down the fucking gates. Cops did not show up on South Street until 20 minutes later. 20 fucking minutes on South Street, Sunday afternoon. You know, one of the pivotal moments when I used to go on tour, people would be like, oh, you're from Philadelphia. Yeah, is it true about the Get Up Kids fight? The Get Up Kids show, uh, where they got beat up. There was uh, suicide machines. They got beat up. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of bands got beat up at the church. Uh, Asian Brian decides that he's gonna take Dee Snyder's son and, and show him, you know, a thing or two about Philadelphia. Uh, I believe it ended with him, Dee Snyder's son, actually being choked out with his own ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> All these Nazi guys come out, and we're trying to kick him out of the club, and people are just following him around and stuff. You know, just basically, I don't know, I, they, I didn't want to beat him up. They were just gonna fight these Nazis, but for some reason we let him get to their car, and then dude pulls out a gun and just starts shooting in the air and we all just fucking take off. We're like, what the fuck? But, you know, they were just trying to run Nazis out of the truck pretty much. And the scene that I was most involved in was just like, just fucked up, almost like wrestling style. I mean, a whole confederacy of scum. Should we have ransom fat, and fucking double penetration, lime cell. When music was dangerous, it seemed. You know what I mean? Like, you didn't know if you were... I, I remember going to tons of shows, you know, like, knowing like there's going to be some fucking shit breaking out here. The violence, while does ruin a lot, it, it, it helps us maintain what we are. It helps us maintain what we do. And, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to see any fights in any shows, but I also don't want to see a time where, you know, this thing becomes so big and it, it, it loses its identity. I think playing hardcore shows is kind of fucking weak, but I mean, sometimes you can't avoid it. Why well, we lost all the great venues that we once had because of fights. When you're playing nothing but shows and you can't play because the venue's getting shut down before you even get a chance to load your uh, equipment in. That's really stupid. Fights generally come from kids who don't understand the scene or kids who are too caught up in things. You know, the violence, we, we did our best to try and stop it. If there was a fight, as many of us as possible would just try to jump in and stop it and be like, look, you know, we're not going to deal with this shit here. This isn't cool. If you fuck up this club, we've got nowhere to have a show next month. What I fucking hate is these people that just start fights with younger kids that just show up, that like obviously do not fit in, but I mean, they're like, oh, they're fucking nerds, they're... Yeah, you got wrong hair, you wear it's just like weird pants, you don't get it yet, but you yeah. have to show. Yeah, they're trying like, to get it. it. Yeah. Like, they're what the fuck, fuck? Just, yeah, okay, just drive them away before you even find out if they're yeah. really yeah. into it. Like, they haven't become a hardcore kid yet. Yeah, we get that you're a hardcore kid. Don't fucking ruin it for this kid who could find out about, this could yeah. be like their fucking life. You were a dork last year. hardcore bands, they will still to this day say it's some of their best shows that they ever had were in Pennsylvania, you know, and it, it made its fucking mark. You've got all those bands from Wilkes-Barre, you know, you've got Cold World, uh, United Youth, Dead End uh, Path, Stick Together, all those kinds of bands. Uh, title Fight, who are killing it, I mean, it, absurdly so. And then, you know, if you like the sort of like more New York hardcore thing, you know, you've got Wisdom and Chains, who are phenomenal. Uh, strength, strength for a reason is still playing, still doing awesome, still super tight and heavy. Um, you've got all these crazy bands coming out, Blacklisted coming out of Philly. We went to Russia for a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> we flew out on like a Friday and we got back on Monday or something. And it was, 
it was crazy. It was just absolutely crazy that that just happened. My guys are like metal guys. Mm -hmm. I come from the punk scene. I come from the hardcore scene. That's what I grew up with, not metal. We, we were down there all the time, you know. We played some of the universities and going to Philly and play shows at the Troc. So it, it was awesome, and it's awesome now. I've been involved with the, the Pennsylvania scene for a lot of years. I, I got Steel's tattoo on my neck. I mean, you know, Jesus Christ. It's definitely on the map now, more than it was, you know, earlier. It's back more recognized, I would say. The OPA scene is very tight, man. It's been, like, it's been the same faces since I started Fury 5 in 1994, you know what I mean? And, and, and it's awesome feeling, you know what I mean? And me, it's real special because I'm a BFL family member, you know what I mean? So, you know, Brothers for Life, you know, it, it, you know, PA is like my home, it's like my second home. If I could move out here, I'd be out here. It's a friendship and a brotherhood. It's like something that I met people from when I was a kid Kids that went to school with me my whole life could come over my house and I would never even let them in my room by themselves. I can meet somebody through hardcore five times and let them stay at my house for a weekend when I'm not even at my house. It's just something that, it's just special. And like some people on the outside will never understand that. And I look back and I mean, these people are my family for a long time. They were the closest people I had to the world to me next to my actual blood. All these fucking frat boys, yuppies, jocks, yada, yada, yada douchebags that are out there in this fucking world and yeah I'm talking to you all you fucking douchebags you don't see this at all this level of camaraderie and brotherhood that we have all established but it was a vehicle just to express myself and 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 an outlet for my frustration with well with everything with the status quo if I didn't like discover hardcore and the scene um, it really for many years like it saved saved me from myself. I think I was introduced to PA Hardcore back in 2002 maybe and uh, due to that website I ended up actually meeting my husband which I don't know if that's a thing to be proud of or not but I did and <laughs> it's something that's very deeply rooted and ingrained in me and my personality and my way of life and my ethics. It shaped my whole life. I mean, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for hardcore. It stops being what you're into and you sort of, it sort of becomes what you are, if that makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not, you're not so much, oh, I'm into this, I'm into this. It's, it's what you are after a certain amount of time. You know? I got to, um, like, travel around in a van, see the world, is to go to a city and instead of seeing a tourist spot I got to like hang out with people I got to go like hang out in a bar in Prague then go to a house party in Prague going to hardcore shows and playing shows and having kids sing along with all the stuff you were was like super highlight this is hardcore it's kind of it's pretty nuts how it's just escalated over the years we're the biggest hardcore fest in the country I didn't think I was ever gonna do that. <laughs> you know, I'm happy that Philadelphia's like stood its ground and, and, and stayed unique. Philly's not the best hardcore scene in the world right now. Love it, love Philly, love Philly, and uh, can't cannot thank you enough, Philadelphia, for what you've done for us. This wasn't always a place that people wanted to visit. You know, this wasn't always a place that people wanted to see shows from. This wasn't always a place that bands came from. You know, appreciate what you have. And you know, people in other scenes just do what we did. Just keep going. You know, like start bands, start teams. You know, book shows. Go to a fire hall and say, "Can I rent this for a hundred dollars?" There is no fucking doubt in my mind that punk rock changed my life. People may talk about New York hardcore and DC and, and Cali. But, yo, know, PA, straight up, much respect to all you guys out there, all you kids out there doing young bands. Killing it right now. Just come to Pennsylvania and go to shows. You'll, you'll understand when you actually see the shows. Stay weird. I don't think your people can help it. <laughs> I think it's, it's something in the water or in the air or something. Nuclear power or, or I don't know, Amish, I don't know. What's up with that Amish Mafia shit? You people really gonna let that happen? <laughs> this is a mecca of hardcore, you know? Other places have been a mecca of hardcore. Some places are for a minute and they fall off. Some places, you know, are slow and steady, but like this has always been a mecca for hardcore. This is what we're, we, we built this shit here. You know what I mean? We, we cultivate it like farmers, you know what I mean? Like th this is something that we love and um, 
we, we'll I, I have dedicated a huge portion of my life to making sure that we have a good reputation in Pennsylvania that people want to come back and go to shows here that we have quality bands that come from here you know what I mean and and uh, that I, I take a lot of pride in it that you know what I mean certain bands that pop up from my area that they're from my area I take pride in that and I try to promote them around the world you know whenever I'm, tra I'm touring or traveling I want to bring them with me you know what I mean in spirit and in, in name at least just so that people know yeah that's one of ours that band's one of ours you know what I mean Strike for Reason yeah that's us you know Cold World that's us you know what I mean Dead End Path that's Pennsylvania Where, you know what I mean what do you want Mush Mouth that's good. Like it's, it, this is Pennsylvania hardcore it's it's our brand. It's something that we take pride in.
Let's say that the Clubber Lang CD on record was paid for by a woman who used to date Steve Bush, and Bush used to shit on her chest in a bathtub. That happened. 